actually he's joined us this morning he's on a campaign trail to be flag bearer of the governing new patriotic party and we're happy to have him for uh, a few moments good morning governor thanks for joining us ah good morning bernard it's, it's... <laughs> i don't know how to describe it but um... <laughs> yeah i know i know i know <laughs> i know yeah. i know i know uh, because I don't know how to say it, because the last, the, the interview I was supposed to do with you, That's right. that was the night where I, I, I lost my wife. So I'm sure it fills you with a lot of emotion to come here yeah, yeah, at the yeah. time when I called you and all that was going on and, and right. all of that. That's so right. That's right. we thank God we are both still alive That's right. to still live yeah, to fight I, another day. I, I thank God for your life and uh, mm. you know, it, it brings me a flood of memories yes. of what I have been through myself. Yes, yes, yes. So, I know I, I, we, yeah. can't, we can't talk about it. We just pray f to God for mental strength and fortitude and emotional intelligence and all yeah. that. We could actually start from there because I feel like death helps you eventually if, yeah. if you survive it. Yeah. it. There's a certain toughness it brings. And if I, when I look at you and some of the things, because I've, I've sort of watched you when you are interviewed about what happened to your dad. And I think you've evolved as well yeah. because you've sort of packed it in a good place. Yeah, that's I'm sure I mean. maybe 20 years ago it must have been tougher when you're younger it's, it's obviously yeah. tougher but yeah. as you grow and you mature yeah. you begin especially you try to douse yourself in divinity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pray to God mm -hmm. and have the emotional strength and fortitude to deal with it mm -hmm. because I quite remember entering the studio that night and you called me and said oh Kwabna there's been a little emergency and mm. I knew it was a little emergency mm. we're all praying mm. that but to get what happened yeah. uh, there's only God who decides yes. so um, so yeah. when I was coming in, I was feeling a bit emotional. I know. I didn't know how to start it. No, it's good. It's, it's fine. I'm, I'm much better. The prayers and the help of people have strengthened me. But it's been six months or so. How have you been? Because I, I sort of, I've seen you around. I've seen your billboards. How have you been? Yeah, yeah. that was the night I was going to declare on your oh, set. That you were going to get the first oh, declaration. Charlie. Oh, Charlie. So your colleague actually took it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a good six months. Mm. Um, had the opportunity to tell my side of story mm -hmm. because we all know what happened in 2015 yeah with the illegitimate and unfortunate suspension from office as general secretary mm -hmm. and i chose not to speak at the time not because i endorsed what happened but all because of my love for this party and i i knew i had done we had done all the groundwork with our internal arrangements successful presidential primaries successful mm -hmm. parliamentary primaries by the time i was being chucked out of office. We had barely five or so constituencies to deal with. And uh, I, I didn't want to cause any disturbance. Uh, I, I issued a public statement answering all the official um, reasons why I was being put on indefinite suspension, which is not known by our constitution. There's no provision there for indefinite suspension of a chairman or a general secretary. Um, but the fact that there was a lack of adherence to our party protocols and the constitution, that's what hurt. Mm. But at the end of the day, if you have the strength and you love your party, you go through it. It's mm. the, What hurt me was the dirty propaganda, the vile things that were said about me that clearly were not true. Um, this gives me the opportunity to speak to the party people who, who love me and they had voted for me massively and trust me. And so I had to go around and explain to them what had happened. And uh, I didn't want to endanger our chances of winning 2016. If I'd gone around this way in 2016, that could have put our victory in some jeopardy. So I just felt, look, let me take a back seat. Mm. Time they say vindicates people mm. and everything. But has the party made, I don't want to use the word restitution, but has... I know that, the, for example, some the, there were certain things that were done that were reversed. But I just want to know legally whether they've corrected what you consider to be a violation of your rights. Well, I wouldn't say entirely so because uh, when you're a general secretary, you're a full-time employee of the party. Mm -hmm. You are not expected to do anything. You're supposed to devote 24 hours of your time to the party. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, you are supposed to be given remuneration. When I talk like this, sometimes the headlines start running the talk about the fact that I hadn't received any remuneration from the party for the four years. Wow. Not even the, my pension contributions. So there's a big hole of four years between 2014 and 2018 in my pension. Wow. Um, and I wrote to the party at, in 2018 uh, when the mandate expired, uh, especially after the Kofrodia Congress. I wrote to Chairman Blair and said, Mr. Chairman, 
I mean, I cannot be on suspension from a position that I do not occupy. Somebody is now the general secretary. So it's only right and fair that my suspension was tied to my office. That mandate has expired. But till today, I haven't received a response. And I don't want to burden the new executives with something that they were not privy to. Mm. Um, unless maybe within the handing over notes of the previous administration, perhaps they had left something in there for the new administration to deal with. So since they took over, I have not asked any questions. But do you not think these things need to be done to even clear the way for you to... Con I mean, I I'm not sure what the constitution says, but if somebody has been suspended from a position like this, is that not a blot in a sense that could even... No, no, that, that you? doesn't. I mean, the letter they wrote to me, I was suspended from my position. I'm still a member. I've continued to pay my dues. Um... um Sammy Crab, who was also suspended alongside me, he contested for okay. the chairmanship of the party this past election. So mm -hmm. I think that shouldn't be mm. an issue at all. Mm. What is important is that there are certain personal things that I left in my office, which I have never understood why they've kept all my personal belongings and all my personal files and stuff. Because when you walk out of your office and you are not allowed to get back to that office just to even pick up your personal belongings, I think that is not fair treatment. And I tried several times to ask my PA, you know, put these things in a box and let me have my things back, my paintings, my personal stuff. I don't know where they are, mm. um, but I'm not prepared to make an issue out of it. It's in mm. the past. Mm. If they will be civil enough to let me have it, I'll be grateful. Um, if the new chairman will look at the constitution which mandates him to determine the remuneration of a general secretary and he can backdate that and make sure I get my four years <laughs> entitlement as general secretary, um, I'll be grateful, but I'm not making any... How does this affect your message when you meet delegates? What is the perception of delegates about what happened between 2015 and 2018? I think, they, I mean, they are shocked at how I have been treated. And I've... I've I have the opportunity to, to go into more details than I do when I'm with you here in the studio because we don't have the time. And, uh, of course, I, I normally do what I call a town hall, an open forum. So I make a few initial remarks and we go into a and a session. And that provides me the opportunity to answer all the questions that are agitating the minds of our party people because they know that Kwame Japan since 1990, 1991, even as a kid, has given my, my youth in service to this party, long dedicated service when times were tough. I mean, in 1992, to be on national television, to be the face and voice of Professor Dubois in his campaign, uh, working as a public servant with Ghana Highway Authority, if you don't have the courage or the spirit of sacrifice for this tradition, you will not take that risk. You know, So they know what I've been able to achieve in this party, mm. um, served uh, President Kofu as press secretary for close to six years, uh, in, impeccably, and uh, nobody could pick a speck of debt and during my time as press secretary. And when you are press secretary, you are privy to very uh, delicate information, local and international. And uh, if my integrity was not called into question, I don't know how I can become general secretary of my party. And people can... Um, plan and orchestrate lies and propaganda about my faithfulness to my tradition and mm. seek to create the impression that I was working against the interests of our presidential candidate, someone that I played a major role in his first presidential bid in 1998. When those who are around now uh, trying to claim him were around, but they didn't have faith in him. And some of us took a risk for him when he needed us most, because it's, mm. it's when you are struggling that you need support, not when you are on top, mm. you know. So um, it, it's provided me a good opportunity to tell my side of the story. There are a lot of people who've been asking, well, now why have you taken so long? I said, it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, sometimes you need that the skills have to fall off at that time. Mm. Um, despite the fact that I issued a formal statement debunking all the claims that were made against me, um, it didn't get any ventilation from the media, and uh, mm. um, I just took it easy. Where, 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 and when did the dream to be president come from, and how long has it been there? Well, it's been there for a long time. I mean, when you work as closely as I did with President J. Kufo, I, I, I learned a lot from his style and his 
magnanimity because, mind you, I didn't support him in the primaries in Sunyani. And for him to accept the fact that I, I was one of the leading campaigners for Nana Kufuado at the time to unseat him, for him to be magnanimous enough to allow me into his campaign in a big way, I was, in those days, there was no director of communications. I, was, I would say I was de facto director of communications in the lead up to the 2000 elections, working with uh, campaign manager Jacob Echibilamte. So I was the one who had the privilege of putting the, through the phone call to him at night, informing him, Mr. Kufo, that you have been elected as president of the republic. And for him later on to appoint me as press secretary for close to six years. And uh, as press secretary, you are with the president almost 24-7. You know, and you, you have very quiet moments with him alone in the office. And mm. uh, a lot of things are said that you have to die with. Mm -hmm. Right. So at the time, I just felt that perhaps I have the dream, I have the passion for this country. I've always felt that we need public spirited individuals mm. who are prepared to do something for everybody else, who are prepared to deny themselves. And mm -hmm. my political career has been anchored on what I call the triple S. Um, service, which means you should be prepared to serve, which I think I have done from 1991 to today. And to also sacrifice when times are tough, even in difficult times, you are prepared to risk your professional career, your life, mm. um, especially during a military dictatorship, to say you want to serve your party for nothing. And then being selfless. Being selfless means looking for the interests of others. And I think I'm imbued with those uh, qualities, perhaps because of what I've been through as a human being, losing mm. my dad very early and going through the difficulties and the troubles mm. and surviving now. I, I realize that I have empathy because I, I know it when somebody says he, can't, he doesn't know where to sleep tonight because I've felt that before. Um, when you don't have, you know where your next meal is coming from because I have felt that before, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, and I have a very multi-layered life. Uh, which, which, we multi don't which we don't deny yeah. in terms of your experience, engineering, media work, working with the president. Some people, however, feel Typically, you would need, for example, MP experience. So some of the aspirants would say they run for parliamentary office and or they've managed a ministry. Yeah. How does your experience compare with that? Do you feel it's an advantage or disadvantage? So if somebody says, for, you, for example, you haven't contested in an election outside your party before, so that's a disadvantage for you, what would you it's say? It's not a disadvantage at all. There's no bigger election in our party than that for a general secretary. In our party, if you contest for an MP, it's in just one of the 275 constituencies. And uh, especially in some of our safe seats, you, all you need is to win the primary. And that's it, you become an MP. Um, winning the confidence of the 6,000 plus delegates going around 275 constituencies and selling your message, especially defeating a formidable general secretary like Sir John in my hospital bed in 37, just goes to show you how deep rooted I am in this political party. Working as press secretary to the president, I mean, you are, very, uh, you are not the president, and that's a fact. Um, you are not running a ministry, that's a fact. But you get the kinds of insights that nobody has. Very few people have those insights. I've, I've been to two G8 summits. I don't think ministers, apart from the foreign minister at the time, would have been to G8 summit and sit with the top eight leaders around the world, around the same table, whether it was in Glen Eagle, Scotland, or it was in Savannah, Georgia, when Bush hosted it. You know, been to several African Union meetings. and So when you serve at the presidency, mm. um, you know how the government runs. Mm. You know? So I think that, yes, uh, I would have wished to have that experience running your own ministry, but I don't consider that a shortfall. Mm. There have been many presidents like Professor Mills who have never run, you know, any ministry or run for MPs and uh, President Liman and all that. So, so I don't not think be a, What about the concept, the question of a base? Because one of the, the ways in which these uh, elected offices solidify a person is to give them, whether it's a regional base, whether it's some type of I'm a national constituency. I'm a national politician. Because as you said, I became a national character before politics because I hosted sports highlights at a time when GBC was the only out media outlet in Ghana. So I became, 
I would say, in all humility, a celebrity like you very early at, 20, <laughs> at 25 years. You know, hosting, oh, you were 25? It was an, a, a when you started? Of, yes, when oh. I was hosting sports I like, oh. in Ghana in the mid-80s, you know, right through oh. the early 90s and then being there for the first time that we were mm. watching the World Cup live in 1990 as, as the panelist and that one of the innovations I introduced to broadcasting, you know, at the time. And so I, I, I think that I'm a national figure. I'm a very detravelized person. Um, I was born in Kumasi, schooled at Royal International School, primary school, went to Infancy for seven good years. <laughs> you know, and then I've stayed in Accra, so... I know for me, it doesn't matter where you come from in this country. I mm. think anybody who tries to organize politics around tribe, religion, and even where still money should be discouraged and debunked. You understand? So for me, I am a very detravelized Ghanaian, and I think we Ghanaians should be very happy mm. that we have been fated to be within these borders. It doesn't matter where we come from. Mm. And especially as the MPP, that's why we are called the United Party. Mm. If you look at the, the 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 amount of institutions, political institutions that came together, the Northern People's Party, mm. the Unlaw Youth Congress, uh, the Gashimofupe, the Fantis along the coast, and then the uh, National Liberation Movement from Bafua Kuto in the in the Middle Belt. This is a truly national party. So however hard some of our opponents try to pigeonhole us as a small Ashanti party or maybe a larger Akan party, they would fail. And I think new politicians, new generation politicians like myself, we should try and discourage the politics of tribe, politics of religion, politics mm. of money. And let's talk about politics of principle. Mm. Right now where we are as a country, what we need are thinking leaders. Mm. Leaders who have deep in thought, intellectual capacity, and character, both private and public. Mm. And that is what I've done to, okay. to submit I, myself I, I to, take your for point, scrutiny. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the point about the concept of a base was not in the sense of owning a tribe or a region. It was more to do with having a certain grassroots support mm. that you bring to the table, table yeah. into a contest. That's right. So and I, I completely agree with you when you talk about we don't need... To, to slice and dice on the basis of region or tribe or religion or money, which is clear. But you are in a contest with at least now about eight or nine people. Yep. And I'm sure some would say to the delegates that, look, if if you put me on the ticket, this is the, the group of people who have promised support for me, or this is how my candidate can influence. I mean, that's why we do North-South tickets. That's why we do different religion tickets, not just in Ghana. The reality is that even Nigeria, in this election, the whole thing is being defined by where the person comes from. People see, even in the U.S., there's the red gash in the middle, the blue on the coast. That's right. People vote on the basis of how they perceive the candidate. So that's a question back to you. That um, I, I, we, I don't want to make that a strength of mine. But, mm. I mean, apart from being a former general secretary, and therefore I'm deep-rooted within this party and I have people, especially right from the beginnings of our party in 1991, 1992, I've worked with most of them and they know me and they trust me. Um, so the party, I'm very deep and strong. in. Um, I would say that, yes, um, you come from a Shanti region, doesn't matter um, for me. Um, it's the biggest 47 constituencies. Um, they recognize me as one of their, their children or sons or whatever. But I've also worked a lot in Greater Accra because this is where I've voted, you know, and uh, a lot of my activism has been here. And Your football it, team is here. It's in Adabraka where we are. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, again, when I talk about multifaceted, because I like sports and all that, so mm. I have a juvenile team for the last 25 years, and uh, the current national goalkeeper, Lawrence Atizigi, <laughs> is a product of Argentinos Juniors, so, which I named after Maradona because of my affection for the one who I believe was the greatest ever footballer that ever. We can have that debate. Uh, and, and never end it. <laughs> so, so, and never yeah. end it. Mm. You know, so um, mm. I think I'm well positioned. Um, I've, I've worked as a civil servant in, in, in Ghana Highway Authority, then left to set up my private consultancy firm, mm. worked as a contractor. So I know how it is when you have to go and borrow money, not even from the bank, 
from a loan shark who who give it to you at five percent a month or or ten percent a month. And I know when you are running a consulting firm and you haven't had a business for maybe mm. eight eight months and you have to pay your your core workers. So that gives me that steel. You understand. I've been worked in government too as press secretary to the president. I've been general secretary of the party. You know, so I know the party very well. I know the aspirations of the party people. And during our time, we tried to strengthen the 275 constituencies, making sure that all of them had accounts opened. And so, therefore, when we needed to resource them by the press of a button at the party headquarters mm -hmm. through our bankers, all of them could be resourced at the same time. So they know. But yeah. is, the, is the flag bearership contest a meritocratic race? And let me explain that. These are delegates yeah. who um, many people feel represent their own interests. So it's not... Okay, let's, let's rephrase the question. What, do we really know what the delegates want? Because you are talking about thinkers. You're talking about your national appeal. You're talking about your track record. A lot of people feel that delegates, not just of MPP, delegates see primaries as their cocoa season. And they are not really as interested in some of the things you're saying as you may think. And that they, they may... If that's the case, uh, Bernard, then only the rich people win elections in our party. Those who have money back in them. Not necessarily rich people. Yeah, I mean, those who have money back in them. But has that not been the case? That has not been the case. It has never been the case. In 1992, Adubo, by no stretch of anybody's imagination, had was the most resourceful. Compared to compared to Safwadu, where all the young people, the young executive from the business people were supporting Kwame Safwadu. He won because... But I do point had a platform. Because he was the voice of the whole Again. breaking the silence. Yeah, so so I have that, I He have was the that. main guy we all heard at Legon talking. <laughs> so he was emblematic of the... Breaking the culture of silence, Edu yeah. Brahim was the man we all saw. So I just want you to understand yeah. that I have trust in the, the delegates of this party. They've done it before in, in Tamale, even in my absence in my hospital bed. When I was not there to do the, 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 the campaigning on the ground or whatever you talk about, if people pay monies or not, I won massively whilst I was still in 37 military hospital. You remember, when I was going to Tamale, I had that near-fatal accident in Insawam. So I have confidence in this. The delegate system, and again, I want to explain to one, if some of them are listening to me, you, don't, you are not there for yourself. So if you think that you're going to make it a cocoa season, that money that you get, the meaning of a delegate is, if you look at a dictionary, delegation of responsibility. You represent a certain amount of people in your catchment area. Are you going to share those monies with them? And in any case, how much money can anybody give you? Divide that by 365 days and divide it by a further four years, and you see that it is nothing. So you cannot mortgage your future, your birthright, which is to decide something that means to you, something to you, your conscience, um, something that will secure the future of our country. And what we, what we are experiencing now this is going to be a watershed election. I mean, no party has won a third consecutive election. So it's always going to be tough anyway. Right now, the leader that we require is someone who can end the trust of the Ghanaian people. In spite of all the difficulties, they can look you in the eye and say, you are a pair of clean hands that we can work with. You have the least amount of uh, questions to answer. And that's the kind of candidate they know and the, the, is beginning to hit on the delegates. Who would they place as our best foot forward as a party? And I do believe when you look at all things being said and done, and you put it on a weighing scale, KAA. So, so are you saying will that resonate very in, in a sense of where the Ghanaian mood is, you need a truly MPP person, but not necessarily somebody who is deeply embedded in this administration, for example. Because there are difficulties that many people will blame this administration for. So if you're a delegate thinking about who to represent the MPP in 2024, you are saying you need to play a balancing act between being representative of the party, but also being able to bring something new. new. And that's why... It's a very my, difficult line to draw, right? Uh, well, it is, but that's why my campaign is uh, premised on the new dawn, the creation of a new dawn. When I talk about a new dawn, a new dimension, a new direction on the Ghana's political landscape, led by the politicians, not the politicians alone, because today you've been speaking to the director of medical services. I've heard Ghana all the Health things. Service. Ghana Health Service, my good friend, Dr. Abuaji. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 
whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a banker or a farmer, all of us have a role to play. And I think it is our Ghanaianness that is disappearing. Our value system, in my view, which has collapsed. And we have been gripped by a sense of materialism that I do not understand. This is not what we were made of when we were kids, you know. We were proud of our professionalism or our knowledge and intellectual capacity. We were not defined by the amount of money that we had. And that is something that is a culture. And that's why I want to make this an issues-based campaign. And I want to use this candidature to let Ghanaians know mm -hmm. that you don't need to be very rich to be very happy. I'm a very happy person, despite all the difficulties and the trauma that I've suffered in my life. And that spirit of contentment, I want every young person to have that. Now, you may meet challenges in life, but you can always scale it. If you have belief in yourself, if you have clean intentions, noble intentions, you know, do it and serve your country. Mm. There's beauty and a sense of fulfillment in serving your country. I'm not saying this because I want to be elected uh, flag bearer and eventually president of the country. I have been press secretary to the president, mm. the rank of a minister. Mm. I could have also taken advantage and done all the things that people talk about politicians do. I didn't add on to my real estate. I didn't go chasing after uh, government plots and that kind of thing. I was there to serve. I meant to serve. And I want to be an example to the rest of the young people, especially the young ones in the, the Tescon or the TAIN, which is the NDC wing, when you talk to some of them. It, they have become so individualistic, Ben, in their outlook. Oh, I'm looking for a scholarship. I'm looking for a good placement in national So It's not all about what we will get out of the system. We should think about what we can do for the Ghanaian could, people. Could that not be a consequence of the fact that our politics itself has deteriorated, quality of leadership across the board has come down, mm -hmm. quality of the message has been reduced, and even the purity of the positions of the parties. Again, when we're in the university, if somebody says it's MPP, there are certain things you expect. That's right. But these days, it's not very clear. In fact, you have twins who are from different parties. <laughs> they just decide, I want to go here, I want to go here. It's almost like it's convenience, right? So some of the things you're describing, are they not a consequence of the times and the <laughs> fact that there's been a general deterioration in leadership quality in the country? That is the reason why I'm in this battle. In fact, this is what animates me to be in this battle, to bring this difficult conversation to the fore so that we, have, we can create a new generation, a critical mass of Ghanaians, right-thinking patriots, public-spirited people in our country who are going in there not to go and fill themselves. Because that is what everybody believes now. You know, because they've seen a few bad examples. Young people who finish university have never worked before, trust into big positions, and within a few years they are showing off cars and having lush weddings and all kinds of stuff. When you are a public servant, and when you're a politician, you have to be sensitive to the Ghanaian people. It's not everything that you should even showcase. And now it's been worsened by the social media and the kinds of things that I see some of my colleagues put on the social media. I'm, I'm amazed and I'm surprised. Once you're in political authority, sensitive to the plight of the Ghanaian people, especially now when there's true suffering. We all know the whole world has been a difficult place for the last three or so years. As Ghanaians, that is when you have to show sensitivity. So we don't talk about leadership enough. The character of the leaders that we need. You know, it's not about money. It's not about throwing money or sharing rice or sharing sugar. You know, so um, I think it's disrespectful, mm. you know, to the Ghanaian people when people engage in that. Mm. And I'm going to stand by what I believe in. Believing propriety, doing things right. W and, would it be easier to get better leaders if we expanded the Electoral College for primaries, not just for even the MPP. Because I recall NDC tried to do this in the 2016 it's, election. It's, it's just, and just they, they, some of the people in NDC I talked to, they actually blame, they partly blame their 2016 defeat to that because they feel like, this is the explanation they give me, the delegates who usually help during the elections felt disempowered by the expanded Electoral College. And so they stayed away. This is their logic, okay? Now, this is an NDC situation. I'm just coming back to NPP. So if NPP have, so for example, if, let's assume we have 50 million voters, and let's assume we have 4 million card-carrying members yes. of NPP. Would that not be, would that not reduce the role of money if you said every card-carrying member of NPP should vote for their presidential candidate? That already establishes a 4 million base. Instead of using this 6,000, 20,000 people and it's, it's because I can come 5,000 people if I have enough money. 
But yeah. I can't come four million people. That's correct. So That's what correct. what are your thoughts around that? So my thoughts are that we are progressively getting there. Mm -hmm. And then we started with just two thousand delegates, mm -hmm. three thousand in in two oh seven when I was the youngest of the seventeen aspirants, you know. So and now because of that, exactly what you have said to minimize the monetization of the electoral process. We mm -hmm. have increased it now. So with the, with the presidential election, um, apart from the superdelegates, which is just a way of pruning down the numbers to five, mm -hmm. we would have to deal with 200,000 delegates. I don't think you can come 200,000 delegates or you can bribe 200,000 people. So that's, that's a, a big number. That's a, that's a big number. So that's why this MPP is a well-structured political institution mm. because you're having the five core executives at every polling station, 39,000 plus polling stations, deciding who their leader is. Okay, so at least it's a better representation of the 4 million people than the 6,000. Okay, but I'm sure eventually as we grow as a country, as we mature, because organizing elections too can be very expensive. I, I quite remember as general secretary, I decided to work with the electoral commission fully. So they were, I put them in total charge of our polling stations and then they ran it as a national election. Mm -hmm. to, to do so for 5 million people and to do so in 38 or 39,000 polling stations is more difficult than running it in 275 constituency centers. Mm. You, you understand? That is logic, logistically um, easier and uh, easier to attain or accomplish mm. than running an internal party primary in 39,000 or close to 40,000. Although that would be good rehearsal that, for that, the main election. That, that's so right. we that's, suffer that's early. Right. We're talking to Kamna J. Pong, uh, former uh, press secretary to the president of Ghana, and Adjaye Kufo, former general secretary for MPP, Executive Director between 2018, I think it's up to 2020, right? Up to 2021. Yes. End of, the, of 2021. Yeah. yeah. And I've heard some of your colleagues say we need an engineer to be president. I've heard yeah. people say that China has more engineers in politics. I'm sure Godfrey will admit to this than, than in most countries. And they feel like developing countries, they need engineers. Well, the Chinese have shown the way. Over 70% of their central committee are made up of engineers. And if you look at the technological advancement that we've seen over the last 20 years, mm. maybe it supports that claim. And unfortunately, in Ghana, we've not had... I don't even that. know if we have enough engineers in politics, in government. I don't even know if, if we went to do it. If, if you pick the ministers who've been in MPP or even NDC, and you do a survey, I'm sure you have more lawyers, more former teachers. That's right. Possibly. The, those from the humanities. Yes. They dominate you, vastly. Over almost 60, 70 percent. Yeah, vastly. Because why, why do they outnumber you guys? Is that you're not many because, or you're not interested no, no, in politics? No, you know, engineers are very... Uh, I would say we are meticulous. We are very focused on our work. And, you know, in school, you know, I, I quite remember Professor Levine, he was an Israeli professor, you know, when he's walking to the academic side at Tech and he sees you even playing football. The next morning, you put an interim assessment. Quick, <laughs> quick. So, you know, they were discouraging <laughs> engineering, focus. Yeah, engineering students from engaging in extracurricular activities. So, you know, engineering students were said to be boring, that we don't dress well and we don't speak well. You know, so it's it's, it's something that we've been trying to win off ourselves. And <laughs> the the tech I, people say, so 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 you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say the people who just science are not serious. But the people who do engineering are the serious ones. You know, so, I mean, and that has been a cultural mm. thing. But I do believe that we mm. bring a lot to the table as engineers mm. because what we conceive, we, we have to design and then build. We don't make our money out of talking. And then when you are building infrastructure, um, you have to do all the redundancies, make sure the safety factor is good, there's co strong, uh, tight confidence interval. Because when there's a fatality with engineering structures, it, it could die. It's a lot of people, it's not just one so person. So engineers are thinkers and doers. And doers. Not just talkers. No, 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 no. no. We, we, we want to act. We are results oriented. We are outcome based because that's why I'm more interested in the outcomes of policies than just saying we have done this. No. What do you have done? What has been the impact on society? That's what I want to... There are two big questions for you I want to bring. The yeah. first one has to do with what is seen as an elite consensus within the MPP to make the current vice president the candidate. And the background to this is obviously the 17. In your time, Ali Muhammad did not get it. There was a whole feeling, indeed, that somehow the running mate or the vice president must be given almost like the first right of refusal. That's not democratic, but that's the feeling. And the fact that Ali Muhammad did not get it, a lot of people feel that they have to give Dr. Baumia the slot 
to dispel the view that the MPP uses and dumps northness. Uh, I, and this has formed some elite consensus that the leadership of the party generally, and I'm not talking about executives, I'm just talking about the people in the party who are ben, the, the people. <laughs> they want Baumia to win. Ben, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Bernard, if you want to be used and dumped as number two, I think everybody would love to be used and dumped that way. I mean, I've said this before. I mean, let's be what, what honest. Let, let's be honest to the facts. Mm -hmm. The party has a constitution. We have rules and regulations. You can't even get on the ticket if you have not demonstrated a membership of five years. The party took a decision, Nito was the general secretary, to waive that, create a, a card for him, and straight on that day, you become number two. It's never happened anywhere. Because of the respect that we have for the candidate at Kufu, I was part of the National Council meeting that took that decision. You understand? So if you've been done such a big favor, a big waiver, the biggest waiver that's ever seen in this, in this our, our party, and you've served as vice president, number two in the country, and you consider that using and dumping, I think that is, I, I, I think- I'm not sure it's him who will say this. No, but the, 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 whoever the, says that, they should stop that kind of talk. I don't want to hear that. But he delivered, he did not, because he was also the major arrowhead for the message of the party, particularly in 2016, the lectures on the economy, the clarity with which it described the, the so failures I'm, of the, I'm, the I'm government. Not, I'm not so going, you, you, I'm cannot, not, you cannot talk about... I'm not going to discuss... I'm coming, you, you cannot talk about the... And sorry, I'm not, I'm not making this an example. I'm just giving an example. You cannot talk about the privilege of being vice president without talking about the work that was done by the vice presidential candidate as well. So it's almost like he, he earned it. But that's how that's what you're supposed to do as vice president. You are part of the ticket. It's your work, it's your duty and your responsibility. It's, it's not a bonus, it's not, it's, there's nothing extra. I mean, those of us who were, even me on suspension at the time, I mobilized resources, supported close to 100 constituencies around the country. That is the kind of dedication I have for this tradition. So. I think it comes with the work. And nobody is denying him his chance to contest. Nobody has said that. Just that we, in our MPP, we have a way of doing things. He's just going to go around and talk to the party people and hope that he wins the ballot. But to try and force a coronation on us, that won't happen. There would be no coronation in this MPP. But what about, you know, what so, about the perception from Ghanaians if he loses? What perception? That there, for that, some reason, again, this is not. It's all I'm part not, of the NDC this, propaganda. No, 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 I'm just. Oh, I'm just I, I've heard from our <laughs> President Mahama yeah. say it that oh, they are going to use his brother, the North now, and dump him. And I think it was a very unfortunate statement coming from someone who's been president. And as I said, we should not organize around tribe in this country. It's despicable, and I want to speak against it. So even if people believe that. Well, I think the majority does not believe that. You don't think so? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You understand? Ali Mahama served this party right from the get-go. From a Dubois in his time, because I quite remember as young people, he would send us to him. You understand? So um, it is for anybody who is interested in aspiring to this office to do what is expected of him. Hit the debt. I mean, he's fortunate. I mean, he's going to go around and he's, he's, he has a convoy. He doesn't have to buy his own fuel. I have to do that. He, 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 can, he can't put up a billboard, <laughs> but you can. For now, he can't. Because he's, it's almost like he's, he's cap-tied. No, he's not cap-tied. <laughs> like he's, he's had an unfair advantage. I've said can you, that. Can you explain the, that? The two, I would say the two that the media is trying to present as the only candidates. I mean, the media is virtually being cultured to present this as a, a two-horse race. It's very far from that. You understand? Baumia is number two, virtue of the fact that he's vice president, politically. Alan Shemating has been number two to Nanado for the last three elections. So electorally, he's also number two. <laughs> so you the media is putting so, the two number two together. Yeah, so I think they are there by default because right. I don't know what they should tell the Ghanaian people what they stand for. I've gone around expressing my views on the new dawn and so people, and I'm explaining to them what I stand for, what I'll bring to the table, like imposing order and discipline in our country, ensuring that there's a drastic penalty regime for those who tinker with our national treasury and having the political will, being decisive, having the vitality to drive the change that I think Ghanaians deserve and the where we should be heading towards. That has been my platform. 
I, I maybe you should call them and ask them these difficult questions too. And I encourage all my other uh, contestants to submit themselves to be humble enough so that their career, their record in government and everything will be, will be examined. That is what leaders are for. That's what leadership is about. To be able to be open about your life and to be asked difficult questions. But, but there are polls that are also showing this. It's not just the media. I've read a couple of polls that have shown Dr. Baumia and Alan as the front runners. A couple have mentioned Kennedy Japan I'm, as I'm well. Saying, I'm saying that... So it's, it's not just a media creation. I'm saying that it is... Oh, I don't know where the, these polls are coming from. But what is important is I've been around politics from a Dubois. But have you done your own polls? I, look... Or do you, because I, I do know I, you, I you know, do... You I, do, know, you know do. The, I know the heartbeat of Ghanaians. I know the heartbeat of our party. I've been around long enough. Okay? So I'm not going to put so much credibility on any poll. When I've finished going around the country, my first round, I've now done about five regions. Then after that, there is a poll. Then I can give a little credence to it because I haven't been around. I've been under the table for eight years. So you don't, even the fact that my name is being mentioned now shows that I've made a lot of progress. These are people who have had visibility for the last seven years as vice president and minister. So, so, that, that so they've influence. had an unfair advantage. You understand? But that is fine. I mean, it's part of politics. You know, so they have that advantage. But I want the whole country and the MPP delegates to understand mm. that what we do as a party is to allow the delegates to make a choice of their own. The mm. power is in their bosom. And if you need it, go there, talk to them, and I'm very confident that they will invest political authority in Kwab Niger, Japan, come the elections. Mm. Final point has to do with the record of this government. Again, we haven't done a poll, but generally everybody would say that this has been one of the most difficult times we've had as a country. And we can't simply blame global crisis for this because I was looking through recent growth numbers for even African countries, Togo, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, they are all going to do much better than Ghana in the coming year. So, yes, we blame COVID, we blame the Russia-Ukraine war, but we know that's not true. The fact is that there was, at some point, we mismanaged the economy. So that's an albatross you have to deal with. That's correct. So how are you going to, what's your economic plan? Well, let's deal with the economics. What's your economic plan? This is, this is to Ghanaians now. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's assume the MPP delegates, we decide whatever. Ghanaians are listening. Yesterday, uh, uh, NDC opened their nomination. So Ghanaians want to understand what Kwame Japan thinks about the economy and how he hopes to revive it. I think first and foremost, we've been running a deficit budget for as long as we can think about. Mm. And I am a firm believer in the fact that you should never spend what you haven't earned. You should live within your means. As they say, cut your coat according to the size of cloth that you have. Mm. You know, budget after budget, government after government tends to do things that is beyond us. We have to be frank and honest and deal with that. Which means um, revenue is difficult to estimate, but at least expenditure you can control. And how best to start it by cutting down on yourself. I think the cost of running Ghana government is too big. And I've said this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's become a bit more fashionable now for other people to say. <laughs> but as far back as 2015, when I was general secretary, I, mean, I had a, an interview on hot issues on TV3, a sister station, and I said that. That the framers of the constitution did not put in the 19 limit for cabinet ministers for nothing. They were giving us an idea of the size of government. And President Kwabnaja Ejapa would not exceed 19. I do think that all heads of ministries should be cabinet ministers. And that's why if you look at the constitution, it talks about the president and his cabinet because the cabinet is the advisory body that works with the president. So this idea of having more ministers at 19 and then limiting the, 19 to cabinet yeah, I, I think doesn't I don't, work for you. I don't agree with that. Mm. And I've, I've said so. A lot of the ministries have to be consolidated, you know, to reduce the numbers. And some of them, I think, should not exist in the first place. Parliamentary affairs, public sector reform. Um, even Chief Tensi used to be a secretariat of the presidency and all that. So um, I think youth and sports, the natural home is education because that's where they do a lot of sports and that's where the youth is. You know, transport should have uh, aviation and, and uh, 
what have you, uh, railways. All within that. All within transport. I think you can isolate only roads and highways because of a central role in a developing country. You did your service at highways. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little bias yes, there. Know. You know, um, aquaculture and fisheries should be under agriculture. It should be a department. So you can have 19. So your first major issue is it's, government it's, lives within its means, cut your quota according to your size. And then there should be one deputy. So No two deputies. No two deputies. So if you have that, the president has one vice president. So 38 ministers. And if you add the 16 wow. regional ministers, then you have 54. And I, th I think that's it. That You can work with that. It's not a quantum of money that you save. Although you save a lot because all these ministries you have to put up uh, civil service machinery that has to back them and all that. Mm. But it's the strong moral message you are sending to the Ghanaian people that you are tightening your belt. It's not about job for the boys. You are serious about what you're doing. Mm. Again, you go to the local government. I don't know what thinking process has brought us right from 110 districts in, 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 at the beginning of the Fourth Republic 200. to 260-something. Yeah. I think it's atrocious. I don't know. That. And, and coming from someone who has reasonable experience in the built environment, because, you know, most of the services that we need are engineering based, housing, road, sanitation, water, energy, you know, and in Accra, for instance, now we have a chaotic uh, <laughs> balkanization. Meanwhile, AM is smaller, in, less effective. We used to have Accra Tema metropolitan area. And when you having to manage engineering functions, you've got to do it from a basement, uh, catchment, catchment wise, basin wide attitude and a holistic view, you know, a global attitude to be able to deal with that. And when you apportion it in small areas and you have mm. um, some DCs or MCs who are very jealous of their turf, the management of the engineering functions become very difficult. And that's what we see with procurements and other things. You know, so that is an area I would like to sit with the stakeholders to see how we can so reverse that. So effective local can, government yes. using a built environment structured approach yes. is something you're going to focus on. Very much so. I mean, um, in, in Ghana, I think we have substituted planning permission for building permission. Nobody hears about planning permission anymore. You know, but an area should be declared a planned area, schemed out properly. And all the elements of the ecosystem and environment to protect the greenery and everything that goes into proper human settlement planning. The kind of you message know? you have seems to be something that middle classes would like. My recent example, and I was talking to Henry Quarter about this, was that, and he did, he did confirm that we, he didn't feel as if the middle class who claimed they wanted order in society, who claimed they believed in the kinds of things he was doing, they didn't actually really support him in his period of whatever, silence. So I'm, 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 so you've spoken about built environment, you've spoken about cutting off. A lot of the civil society groups, a lot of the people would agree that this was needs to be done. But there are people who must support this type of thing because there's always tension. There are people who do not believe in what you're saying and they'll fight it. Okay. So you need people to support you. That's correct. Do you that, feel that, like that, that the, 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 middle, the, 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 the Ghanaian middle class have, and this is across parties, will they support that type of, in a democracy which is, fueled by many things other than reason, in my view. That's right. And that's why there should be constant engagement, consultations and engagement. And I think what we miss out as a government this time, mm. that we haven't done adequate consultations on a lot of the programs that have created problems, the E-Levy or even the debt exchange. You know, you don't take a unilateral decision. And then when there's a backlash, that's when you go around and say you're doing town hall meetings. You know, those things have to be schemed out properly. That's why I talk about outcomes. Whatever policy that you're going to follow, you've got to be able to do a predictive model and be able to establish what your likely outcome is. That's what we do as engineers. And then give yourself a very tight uh, confidence interval, plus or minus that. You know, you can deviate, but not by much. You know, so it is important that whatever economic model that we pursue, and Ghana has pursued a lot. Uh, right, ERP, uh, Economic Reform Program 1, SAP, FinSAP, and all that. It's not about the programs itself. It's about the lack of enforcement of regulations, the lack of proper management of these programs, and then procurement, lack of money, mm. a, a lack of value for money. In Ghana, every major initiative becomes a procurement opportunity for some. You know, so, and these are things I want to look at. Mm. Apart from cutting down the size of government, mm. making sure that value for money for Ghana 
is something that is dear to our heart. If you look at the recent uh, uh, reports of the Auditor General. Hmm. You know, it, it lays bare. It's not only down to the politicians sometimes. I mean, they are the ones, they have become the whipping boys, you know, but the state establishment is tough, the state institutions. You know, you, you can have people who work in ministries who set up their own companies and then allocating jobs to themselves. You know, you can have headmasters or matrons appropriating food for school children to themselves. This kind of behavior has to stop. You know, and, and, and we need more public-spirited people in charge of our country. And they want to see the direction coming from the top. You know, and so I would be very firm, decisive, take the difficult decisions when they have to be taken. You know, so... Some think the MPP currently, the al government is going to make it difficult for the MPP to get re-elected because of a lot of things. The policies you know, I don't even have to go through. There's a lot of disaffection for the government because of the policies, particularly the debt exchange, which has wiped out people's incomes, the manner in which they went about some of the things they did. So it's almost like, you already said eight years to, re to go beyond it is already tough enough. It's tough enough. But it's already made much tougher by some of the policy choices of this government. Even the posture. For example, people have asked the president to do, or suggested to him to do like a national meeting to discuss the tough economic decisions before the IMF. He doesn't do it. He seems to be committed to what he wants to do, for good or bad. I mean, you <laughs> How how is the how is the how is the MPP going to wriggle itself out of this that is, massive? That is why I'm telling the delegates that it's time for a new generation leader. It's time for them to have a messenger who can win the faith of Ghanaians to reignite the confidence that people have in the political architecture in governance in general, and and I think that kind of person is me, you know. Mm. And so um, that, that is for them to make that choice. You understand what I'm trying to say. So it is a, it is a very tough ask. Um, having a third term is difficult, and we are in difficult times. But I always have the confidence that the MPP has the numbers, especially. I mean, if you look at our victories, all the time when we win, we have big, big, big margins compared to the NDC, sure. which means that if we have our base well manicured and strong and motivated and enthusiastic, um, then we, we, we give ourselves a chance. So if you have a candidate like KAA, then you enhance those chances, you know, because I have less questions to answer. You know, so those are the things that I'm telling the delegates, and I think it's resonating positively with them. And the Ghanaians are... Let me read some comments for you. Maybe that will help situate this in, in good, in good uh, context. Um, so, okay, that I will read all, then you come to... Ben, please ask Komneja for more public policy gaps or issues identified as constituting critical problem areas for national development and how you propose to deal with them. I think I tried to do that after this came. This one from Egbert Zwale. Hello, Ben. I'd extend my greetings to Sina Kabunai Jepong and on behalf of my brother, Daniel Petigo, who happens to be his friend, our prayers are with him as he embarks on this great objective of head leading the MPP. And then this one, Ben Apiso Kabunai Jepong. We love him. He's a correct guy. I pray he wins Michael from Achimota. A uh, couple of ones here. I'm listening to Kabnei Japan's interview. These are my observations as a communications person. One, we have to look uh, for Kabnei Japan. We have to look out for Kabnei Japan. He's a good communicator. He knows his history. MPP must brave themselves. He's charismatic, articulate, and I believe he will draw the young, undecided constituents. He makes good impression. He's on the ground, understands the grassroots dynamics. I think going through what MPP put him through has made him more resilient. He will become the NPP underdog, in my view. We have to look at him more carefully. Uh, Sky, you didn't tell me the name of the person who sent this text. Maybe the person wants to be anonymous. Okay, but this obviously is somebody from the high echelons of power. <laughs> Good morning, Ben. Please welcome to Japan. He's the best of all them. It's only him or JM that can change Ghana. I love this man. You have to comment on this. He's deep in thought. <laughs> they say you or JM. <laughs> Good morning, Kamena. Kamena Japan is good, I admit. But for MPP to win again, I doubt. With what this nation has been Destroyed too. Nothing is working. Health, education, finance, employment, youth engagement, housing. Come on. I've been up from Adenta. Good morning, Bernard. Kwame Japan is awesome. I admire him so much in the MPP, but he's in the wrong party. He's passion and love for the country out of this world. Jones. La. Hello, Bernard. Good morning. I really admire Kwame Japan. I look, I would, I look up to be like him, to become a big engineer like him. We need an engineer to be president. In Ghana, this one from Amasaman. Good morning, Bernard and team. Please tell Kamne Jepo I'm a delegate in Upper Manya Krobo and would like to lead his campaign in the constituency. I'm feeling from Masesewa. Hey, people are moving. A uh, couple more. Bernard, please stay on the engineering issue. We don't talk to make money. 
we conceptualize design and bring to reality. We always show work. This is Ernest, <laughs> who's an engineer listening. If you had a lot of engineers, you would have, I don't know if you have even have a thousand engineers in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. You know, if you were... Well, he would have the... <laughs> no. How many engineers do you have in Ghana? <laughs> in good <laughs> standing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. But at least at the Ghana Institution of Engineering, yeah. Yeah. we have... Uh, more than 11,000 registered professional engineers. Oh, registered oh okay, that's not bad. 11,000? Yes, yes, yes. Registered. If we add the non-registered ones, maybe 15K. Yeah. yeah. And, it's it's and, not and, bad. And then we have uh, our, what I call um, our our cousins. The Let me ask my colleagues what they think. So we've been debating this interview <laughs> as, to, as to how to approach it and whether, we spent almost an hour discussing how to even do the interview and what to say. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, because that's we felt like the MPP itself hasn't even decided when it's going to do the primaries. We don't even know whether the media is a legitimate part of the pre. Because the, you know, the NDC has. But we, have a, we have a constitution. We don't know when you are doing your primaries. No, no, but the constitution gives us a, a limit. I don't know when, why there's a, there's an issue about this. Oh, okay, so ex- educate us. So, I mean, the when, I have to check, but I think when it's eleven power. months. When in power? I think it's eleven months. I think when in power? Eleven in months power. or twelve months. Well, so basically, at least by, least by the end of, by the end of this year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so December. I quite remember when I was general secretary, and I fixed it. That was two years. I fixed it at December sixth, twenty fourteen. That's when my attacks started because some people thought I was trying to give Alan Shamatin an opportunity to campaign. You know, because oh. it was, you know, so that's when a lot of the attacks started. But again, so this have, argument about the date is real. The fact that people are not sure because, because we understand. Because they think it. that when you give Kabna Japan time, <laughs> I will reach out to the people, you know, and so and the an earlier would, Congo- an earlier Congress would uh, would would work to the advantage of those who have invisible by way of their position oh, they occupy because people are not testing their message. Nobody has tested the message of these. Uh, I get you. So, so when not. when we when we move it further. People like you get the chance well, to... I think we should just res- respect the constitution. And the constitution says when in power, 11 months. Yes. So by December this year, there should be preparations. Yes. Worst case scenario, I think, will be January. Where, I, I think I have to check whether it's 11 wow. months or 12 months. Huh? No, it's when you in power, uh, less than a year. Yeah. It should yeah. not mm-hmm. exceed more than 12 wow. months. Yeah. yeah. So I think December 6th, 2020. Let me go back to something. 20, uh, 2007, we covered the MPP, where the 17 were. Mm-hmm. And some of us in the media were like, ah, these guys, if they would just come together... Because I feel at the time, I may be wrong, there was a feeling that Alan was the preferred candidate of Kufo, and then there were a lot of the others who felt like they needed a change. So I recall when the, the first round finished, one or two interviews with you and other people said, there's no way anybody's going to give their support to Alan now. Because it's almost like, because we've all lost, we are going to go for Nanado. Now, my question is, we, we are in a sort of similar but not the same situation where I, th- I think about nine of you have come out. So there's, of course, Alan, there's you, there's Adaini Mo. There's um there's a preco- 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 there's uh, uh, yeah. there's the minister of agriculture then there's also Jogate, Jogate. My, my colleague. yeah yes nine is not seventeen yes. but don't you shouldn't you guys be talking shouldn't you guys be discussing particularly with where the party is and where the country is or maybe I should reverse the question are you people talking <laughs> Well, I think a lot of us are friends, so mm. we, we talk amongst ourselves. Mm. Um, I've had a lot of chat with Dr. Prok, who's my senior, and somebody I've known from Dubois' era. Of course, Alan is like a big brother to me, so once in a while I'll call him, we'll poke a few jokes at each other. Um, Boache was my senior in infancy film school. Yogate is my colleague, we have classmates. Also, Kabuchi, man. Kabuchi. <laughs> you know, so um, I think it's for us to... Sometimes you have to feel it out. It's important. For me, it is important because I have to go out there and sell my story and let people know what I believe in as, as principle. I think it's, 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 the passion is not about the presidency. It's about the transformation of the Ghanaian. And these are strong, firm principles that I've always espoused. I mean, right, I have YouTube videos of me as press secretary in 2004. And sometimes when I watch them, I, I, I think... Apart from that, I had a lot more hair. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm saying this. You had punk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, I, I've been very consistent. This, yeah. These are the things I believe in. And mm. it, it, it can be a bit controversial. Mm. Because yeah, somebody asked me at one of my town hall meetings with the executives, <laughs> Mr. Japan, you're saying that you're going to cut down the ministry. We want some more ministerial positions. I said, look, ministerial positions are not jobs for the boys. We have to create the very economic true. environment yeah. for you to become big. You don't need to be a minister 
to grow economically where you find yourself. That's what we are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But I think the position of a minister should be an exalted one. There should be very few people, 19 out of the 35 or so million. So we hold it in quick, high quick, esteem. I, just and another then, quick point. I notice the Kwabna Ajay keeps coming up and it just occurred to me that maybe because there's another Ajay point in the race. Yeah, people keep e spelling my name wrong. It's, this is correct. So A-G-Y. E as in Eric. Not, not the, a Japon, it's a Japon. A -G -Y -E. How different is that from Kennedy? A Japon. Kennedy, how, how does Kennedy say spell it? I think it's his. It's, it's Ohine Japon. So it's a, a compound name. Ohine, yeah. Yes. He, some people think he may be the a Japon that actually becomes the dark horse because we've, we've seen, I mean, he's shown in the polls and he's also, he has a whole media establishment to himself and he seems to have a message that resonates with delegates. Well, I mean, I think that my, mes my message is resonating very strongly with the Ghanaian people and the mm -hmm. party delegates. And I'm one who is known better in the party and my roots are deeper mm -hmm. in, in this party than most, you understand. So um, I'm very confident of what I'm doing. Um, like I said, I, I, you don't take anything for granted in elections. All right. We don't take anything for granted in elections and I respect the the sanctity of our electoral system, and I do believe that mm. they would not mortgage their future, mm. you know, uh, for some handouts. They would look at us, listen to us, and be able to evaluate us, and especially within the special delegates. So in, in, a fair the, in a fair contest, if you're among the top five in a fair contest, you think you will win? Oh, definitely. You think you definitely. will? Definitely. I, I, I think I will win. I'm very, you, you, I'm and you're sure you get into the fight. That's how it started. I mean, I remember when I was contesting St. John, all the polls, Ben Epps and everybody, they didn't even give me a prayer. <laughs> I wiped him out over 1,500 votes when I was... On the hospital in, bed. That's right. So <laughs> this is someone who is very deep. I sound like a Zuma now. <laughs> Well, that's my good friend, the professor. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wiped him out of the hospital bed. Yes. So um, I, I'm very confident. Mm -hmm. um, it's just to pray to the Almighty to give me the strength and the resources. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Yes. Raising the money. People are looking for money. Raising the money is tough. That's, Moving that's around the country. difficult, it's difficult. Part. Even it's if you don't give anybody money, just it's, doing a campaign is yeah, yeah, expensive. I mean, I mean, having the, the, the cars... Your, Just your, moving to the places. Your, your campaign team. However, small, mine is very modest and very small, but living in hotels, having to eat, and you know, supporting the, the delegates with their transport, it's only it's fair. Easy. I mean, if you go to Kofredi and somebody it's has come from a farm plane, I think it's only fair that Something he, small. you support his, uh, <laughs> his transport. No, we'll invite you yeah. again, don't worry. Yeah. So, uh, uh, when you go around your next five regions, come back. Yes, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm going to Sefi also on Monday. Wow. And then from there, I'll go to go also to meet a Hafo, then Bono in Sunyane, then Techiman. So next week, I'm in the middle belt. Wow. And then I'll come back and see if I can recharge. So I'm calling all those who are listening to me. Yes. We'll do a little fun, uh, fundraising. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, we have a, 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 a Momo number that says KA for President 2024. KA for President. Yes. K -A. No, you announce the mobile number. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yes. We won't charge you. <laughs> oh, go on, go on, go on. Ah, if the guys are here, can they bring me the mobile number? number. Charlie, yeah. The way he has spoken today. <laughs> no, 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 Charlie, no, 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 Mm -hmm. because if you go to one or two big men to give you money, then we don't know how they control you. So the Obama approach is good. The fact that you're saying, look, let's come on board. I think that's the way to go yes. for political campaign. Oh, yeah, it's a great thing. Yes. The way so to we go. all contribute 2 CD, 5 uh -huh. CD, 10 uh -huh. pesos, uh -huh. instead of doing Charlie. Yeah, but the only difficulty there is, is tax. It, it, no, not even tax. It's, it's right. about but knowing it can, it can sometimes be, it, it can be monitored. externals, you know, putting their money yeah. in there. Oh, you mentioned it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's 020 uh -huh. 008 uh -huh. 18. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat it? Zero two zero 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 eight. Yes. Mm -hmm. One eight mm -hmm. two eight. So that's the Momo number. That's the Momo. You can donate via Zell to those outside. Mm -hmm. And when you use K A A for president, that's for mm -hmm. president at gmail dot com. Okay. You know okay. K A A all in small caps. Mm -hmm. Four as in four number. Mm -hmm. President at gmail.com. That is donate via Zelle. So those who are listening outside yeah. can also donate. So the, the number is 020? 020-008-18-28. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
0208-2018-1828. All right. Comrade, thank you. It's been good talking to you. Good to have you back on it's air. A, it's a pleasure. Well, it's I'm a pleasure. sure we'll speak um, again before the date for the big one. Definitely. Yeah. So that was I, I, I always pray that you be you grow stronger and stronger. Amen, amen, amen. We'll be right back with some of your messages and some tidbits. This is the City Breakfast Show. Don't go away. This is the City Breakfast Show. The city's biggest conversation.